using is um, kind of a question and answer session. So we have, we get several um, different uh, questions about systematic reviews over the years. And um, we decided to do this recording and do this presentation so that you all can get an idea of what, how the library can help you and what services we have. And then also um, we'll have give an opportunity for you to um, ask your qu own questions. All right, I have a couple more people joining. So again, welcome everyone. Um, this format is gonna be a pretty informal question and answer session. We're gonna go through and talk about um, questions that we frequently get, and then we will answer the, any questions that you all might have. So I do want to um, give a plug for additional research workshop series that will be coming up later in the semester. Um, we have one on managing your data, um, NIH data management and sharing policy, and then we have two in November that are similar or that will um, kind of cover systematic reviews as well, pieces of them, um, which review methodology should I do, and then why write a protocol. So those are, um, you can register for those on our research guide. Okay, so let's get started with how can the library help? Um, the library has been helping with systematic reviews for quite some time. And we do have a systematic review guide that will, um, we'll put the link in the chat for that one. Um, and we kind of want you all to understand that we do enjoy helping with these systematic reviews. And sometimes you might have, um, you might uh, have someone tell you to undertake a systematic review and maybe you're not so sure what it is. Um, so we can kind of tell you more information about what a systematic review entails. We can guide you along the way of, is this the right methodology that I should be choosing? Is this um, the right kind of question that is answerable through a systematic review? Um, we have a couple of different ways that you all can reach us. We suggest that you fill out this request to systematic review consult. Um, that's your first step in getting assistance from us. And then we have three different levels of how we can help. Um, so we can be a consultant, which means that we meet maybe two to three times and we'll discuss your project and your needs. And we'll su suggest some tools and resources. Um, the level two is a facilitator. And if we're going to do that kind of level of assistance that we ask for an acknowledgement in your paper or in your grant proposal, um, and this may include multiple consultations. We advise on the review type and the search terms, citation management. And then we also suggest some tools and resources. And then a level three is a collaborator, which means we are a part of your review team. So we co-authorship is required for this one, for this level. And we meet, we're included on all the consultations with the review team. We advise on the review type. Um, citation management, protocol registration and development. Um, we develop and run the searches, and then we also perform um, the methodology section. We will write the methodology section of the manuscript. And so uh, we do have on the research guide, uh, there's several different um, sections that will kind of touch on some of these as we go out through the, um, the presentation today. So we have different sections, um, kind of like how to develop a question, create a protocol, search the literature, conduct screening, appraise, and report results. So librarians can be involved in the developing a research question, creating a protocol, and searching the literature. When it comes to screening the, for the articles and the synthesis and the praise, we don't do as much there. So we're not really involved in those pieces, but we do have um, resources and tools to help you, and we can advise on best practices um, if you're just unfamiliar with that process. Lauren, do you have anything to add? Okay. No, I don't, I'm good. <laughs> Great, so I'm gonna let you um, take the next one. Yep. Just one second, there we go. 
So what type of review should you do? Um, so it really depends. So there's been kind of this new discussion and systematic reviews of calling these things evidence syntheses, right? There's different specialties that do different type of review types. The two most common ones that we get are scoping reviews and uh, systematic reviews. And, but there are a bunch of others. There's some rapid reviews, there's integrative reviews, there's umbrella reviews. There's lots of different ways to approach these type of reviews. And those are also called evidence syntheses. We actually have some um, tables here and we'll be doing a session again in November that will walk you through how to choose the right review type for you. Um, but it, a lot of these review types really depend on your question. Um, so, you know, systematic reviews are very defined questions. They're very clinically based questions usually. It's usually comparative in nature. They fit into a framework like PICO very well. Scoping reviews tend to be more vague, right? Um, the questions are usually scoping the literature. They're not as comparative in nature. Um, so, you know, that's, it, it really depends the review type and your question, but it also depends on how you are planning to analyze the data, right? So systematic reviews and meta-analyses often go together, while um, scoping reviews are usually more of a qualitative analysis. Um, a qualitative analysis. And we also have a bunch of resources on our LibGuide here um, under the question page that kind of breaks down these, these differences as well as provide foundational literature on the methodologies themselves. So there's actual foundational literature on how to do a scoping review. Um, so this is a really great place to start um, and really consider when you're doing this type of review what your question is and what review type fits best with your methodology. Planning that out ahead of time really will set you up for success. And I'll just add that um, sometimes um, users will come to us, come to the library, and what they're really wanting is just a systematic search. They're not wanting to do an actual systematic review. And so that can be confusing, especially for students, because they you, the professor might say you have to do a systematic literature search, but they think that it's a systematic review. So clarity in the questions and clarity in instructions is very important. So we want to, um, to make that, uh, if you have questions, we can answer those and kind of help and guide you along the way. Um, systematic reviews generally take about 18 months to do. So if you're thinking this is in a semester assignment, Probably not gonna, <laughs> probably not gonna be a full systematic review. It might be a systematic search. Okay. So, do you have to write a protocol? So, <clears throat> it is yes is the answer pretty much. Um, you should register a protocol. You can publish it in journals like BMJ Systematic Reviews. They publish protocols. Very few journals are publishing protocols at this point, but that has been changing over recent years. Um, the reason a protocol is important is it increases the validity of your systematic review or evidence synthesis. So the reason it improves it is because you're essentially stating how you're going to analyze your data, what your question is, what your search strategies are, all of these things before you actually start searching. And that reduces bias. So that's the really important part of a protocol. Also, Prisma launched um, some new frameworks um, in 2020, I believe, that actually require a protocol. So there's actually a protocol extension now, and there's other areas um, about protocols out there. So the answer is yes. And we do have resources available. Um, like starting how to write a protocol. Um, we have a template both in DMP tool and um, you can actually click that here. We also have a PDF of that available. So if you don't use DMP tool, if you're not familiar with it, it's actually like a fill in the blank type of product. It walks you through the process, but we also have a PDF. So if you don't wanna do DMP tool, we have a PDF you can download and edit and write from there. So that's what's really great about the uh, the the resources on our, our protocol page. Now I'll just add that there's um, we have examples in the DMP tool and in that PDF document of um, scoping reviews and systematic reviews. So we have um, language for each. So we have examples and it's really um, helpful. And if you need it, you, it would be under that develop a protocol um, button on the systematic review guide. Okay, so the other question that we get quite a few, 
quite a lot, is how many and what databases should I use? So you're going to use multiple databases and this does reduce bias. Um, you're going to use a minimum of two to three for every systematic review. And you're also going to, um, in order to help reduce the bias and be as thorough and expansive as possible, you're going to use other topic specific databases. So typically we tell people to use Medline PubMed. So Medline is in PubMed. PubMed also includes PubMed Central. So we want to search uh, Medline via PubMed. We also um, typically will search Embase as well, and then Cochrane Library. And then you start adding in your subject specific databases. So if it was a nursing topic, I would add in CINAHL, which is a nursing database. Um, if it's a um, mental health topic, I would add in PsycInfo. If it's an education topic, I would add in ERIC. And um, we do have resources for other database, for other disciplines. So things like engineering, music, we have um, listings of other databases on our guide that would, um, that you would, that you could use. And we would also advise you to consult with some of our system, some of our um, liaison teams or subject teams to um, know which ones to search. Um, we have a link here for all of our library databases. There's over 700, so it can be overwhelming if you're not sure which ones to choose. Okay, so what is hand searching and why is it important? Um, so hand searching um, will help you locate materials not found by traditional database searching. So hand searching um, is usually done um, at the end of your review process. Um, it is where you are looking at your included articles and you're going through the reference list of those included articles and you're reviewing every single citation. The theory is if these articles are included, then their references might have articles that should be included in your review as well. You have to remember that you're trying to catch all of the literature on your topic that exists. That's the goal, right? So to do that, hand searching is very important. Um, you can also do table of contents or key journal searching. That's also called hand searching, which can be done earlier in the process. Um, so instead of just doing database searching, you can actually search specific journals. So maybe a journal is an index in a database or it hasn't been updated in the last year inside of PubMed, for example. Um, so those are reasons you would also do specific journal searching. Um, that tends to be less common, um, but it, it is done uh, at times. Um, but the reference list is almost always done, no matter what review type you're doing. And then another question is, what should I use for inclusion and exclusion criteria? So this really does depend on what question you're asking. Um, some of the common ones that people um, do would be, um, you know, a geographic location or language or participants or a setting. Is it in the hospital? Is it not in the hospital? Is it in home care? Um, the study design is an R RCT. Um, so these are the kind of the types of um, inclusion and exclusion criteria that we would recommend. Um, and again, it all is based on your question. So without your question, we really couldn't tell you. Um, but generally, this um, kind of chart shows some more common inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, again, it really does depend on your question and um, kind of what you're looking for. And so a lot of times students don't understand, um, and I won't even just say student, and faculty. <laughs> um, so people that are not familiar with the systematic review process tend to try to limit, use that inclusion and exclusion criteria in their search strategy. And so that's not, um, that's not a recommended practice. We recommend that you, when you're doing your title and abstract screening and your full text screening, that you use those inclusion and exclusion criteria to screen your results. And then you have to document that in your Prisma flowchart. So you have to um, know exactly what you're doing, what will be um, your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, all of that is decided in your protocol before you ever start doing the review. 
Yeah. And I would add, I always tell my teams that the search cannot do your inclusion exclusion for you. Right. Um, and that's often what people want to happen because the results for these types of searches are really large. Your search can't do that. The human part of it has to be the part that does this inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, so there's very few times I actually add these things like date and language um, to my searches. Often that's done once the data has already been extracted. Um, at a manual level. So that's just one way I always recommend to think about it. Yeah. So this, I guess, um, to kind of reiterate what Lauren said is, you know, this is your inclusion and exclusion criteria, not your search criteria. <laughs> and that can be really confusing for some users that aren't um, familiar with systematic reviews. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say like some people think you can just put like RCT in there um, and as and have that as a limiter, um, but that's you can't do that. There's actually whole filters that have been designed and published on that have precision and sensitivity rankings on them that have to be used. So it's it's a really complex a complicated process, but we're always here to help with that. Yeah, we have we have lots of resources for filters and hedges. Um, so yes, definitely contact one of your librarians to help with that process. Okay, so I'll take this one. <laughs> um, um, can I just use keywords? So no, um, <laughs> you can't, like a lot of the times you'll see searches, um, you've probably seen these in the literature where people are searching things like three words for their systematic review searches. That's almost always incorrect. That is not a well-developed search strategy. It's not replicable and it's not reproducible. Um, and it's not going to give you the best results. You actually have to use keyword searching in conjunction with subject head searching. And those things have to be translated between different databases because every database speaks a little bit different, right? If you're using Title Abstract and PubMed, you have to use Title Abstract in PsycInfo, for example. So you have to translate that. There are some major subject heading databases, or um, there's some major subject headings in specific databases. Um, PubMed has MeSH, CINAHL has the CINAHL subject heading, PsycInfo has the APA thesaurus of psychological index terms. There's also databases that don't have subject headings, like Web of Science, and that's a time when you would only use keyword searching. Um, but again, you're usually searching multiple databases, um, and you kind of have to change your search, um, but keep it as consistently as possible between those. So yes, you need to use keywords, but yes, you have to use subject headings as well. So how do I know if my search is correct? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, use the systematic review guide for searching tips. Um, talk to your subject specialist. We can, if you're um, looking for someone to just be a consultant, we can look at your search for you. If you're working with us um, in kind of the facilitator or the co-author role, um, we would do that for you. And you could also use the press checklist. This is a checklist that's um, recommended for the search strategy that kind of uh, tells you like, is this everything that I'm looking for? Did I do, do I, did I follow all the steps? Um, so if you do talk to a subject specialist or one of your librarians, we might ask you kind of this set of questions. Like, did you include all your concepts in the strategy? Did you use appropriate subject headings? Did you use subheadings or floating, floating subheadings? Did you use natural language in addition to the controlled vocabulary? Did you use appropriate synonyms and acronyms and account for, you know, British spelling? Excuse me. Um, did you truncate? Um, did you use the limits? If you use the limits, we're probably going to tell you not to use the limits. <laughs> um, so again, all of these, um, did you use field searching and Boolean operators? Um, did you check the ind indexing of re relevant articles? Did you use a mesh uh, analyzer whenever you started the search? So all of these questions, and if you are overwhelmed with all these questions, then you probably need to um, consult with us in the very beginning before you start your searching. Um, again, uh, lots of times people will come to me and say, I have this search, I'm done. I found all my articles. Can you look at my search? I'm like, well, if you've already done it, <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell you um, to go back and edit it. So 
again, if you involve the librarians um, in the beginning of the process, when you're in the beginning stages, we can help you and um, suggest search terms for you. Um, and again, so the other part of this is, you know, how do I know if my search is done or if my search is correct? Um, a, along the lines of this question is, you know, what's a good number of articles to get? And so we typically say, you know, if you're getting, you know, 10,000 articles, um, I, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, I, I have this number in my head, but I haven't reviewed my slides. So I think 50%, oh, 75% is um, excluded in the title abstract review, and then like another 50 in the full text review. So if you have like a search with your initial search was 10,000 articles, you could only have like 10 to 15 included articles in your review. So don't be scared of numbers. <laughs> yeah, it goes really quick. Most people get really afraid of the numbers that we're returning and they want to narrow it. But the goal of these searches is sensitivity. It's not precision searching. Um, so just be aware of that. And it does go really quickly because a lot of them you can exclude because you're getting a lot of noise because you're increasing that sensitivity. <clears throat> so we also get this question a lot. Can I limit to the last 10 years? You have to have a rationale behind it, right? So um, I've worked on ones where a new law was was introduced and um, we were able to use that date as the date in which we're going to start the search because there's not going to be any literature related to that law before that date, right? And we can cite that law in our protocol. Um, that that's a really good reason for using it. Or maybe a therapy was introduced or um, discovered or something like that at a specific date. Those are reasons to add a date limit. Otherwise, you should not be adding a date limit. You should be doing through inception of the database. Um, so that would be my best um, advice. And um, I'll do this one. Uh, do I have to use the PICO framework? So if you're not familiar, if you're not in a healthcare setting, PICO is patient intervention comparison and outcome. It's a typical framework that's used for clinical questions. And um, typically you use some type of framework for a systematic review or a scoping review. Um, you don't have to use PICO. There's other frameworks available, um, PCOT, PCOT-T, and PCOP, and all these <laughs> that are listed on the slide. Um, there is a, an article that um, is very, very elaborately explains how these um, frameworks, what they are and what they mean. And then Lauren has a slide here. I yeah, so this, about that. <laughs> yeah, of course. So this is a link um, that you can find um, on the slides and you'll get this in the follow up too. But this is an article about systematic reviews. But this is just a really great place to go and look at your question type. So if it's an etiology question or if it's a diagnostic test question, it breaks down the format. So like PICO versus PICO with a little O, which is context instead of um comparison and outcome. Um, it has Cocoa Pop. It has all these different ones. So it really helps you break down which framework fits your question. I would say most people come to me with like a PICO question and it doesn't work for most of the questions that we get, right? It works very well for a true systematic review search. It doesn't really work for scoping reviews very well. So I like to share this because it shows you there are different frameworks that are just as powerful as PICO that can better meet your needs for your own research. We um, we have a few more slides and then we'll get to your all's questions. Um, does UK have a subscription to Covenants? So if you're not familiar with Covenants, it is a um, a systematic review uh, software that kind of helps you with the, um, the appraisal and synthesis and the screening. It can also help. With, um, it doesn't really help with literature searching, but it can also help um, with managing all of your references. Um, we don't have a subscription to it, um, but we are currently, um, we have some demos for Covenants and Distiller SR. Distiller SR is another product similar to Covenants. We have those um, demos of those uh, upcoming in October, later in October. If you're interested in attending, you can put your name in the email address in the chat, 
we are evaluating those products to determine if one would be good for um, for us for the library to purchase. So um, I would suggest that if you're from a department and you're interested in something like this, tell your colleagues about it. Um, get the word out that we are going to, and we will also <laughs> be sending things out to um, some of our um, contacts for um, that have been using Covenants. Um, they use it typically, since we don't have a subscription to it, people have been using it, um, purchasing it with their grants or um, doing um, a trial for it. Yeah, and I would throw out too that we don't have covenants or or di or distiller SR right now, but there are a bunch of free ones we do have available on our LibGuide again. Um, you have that link in the chat. Um, there's things like Rayon and there's SR Accelerator and there's EndNote and there's other tools that can be used currently um, to meet these needs. It's just that, that these are going to streamline the process. Okay, do you export to EndNote? So yes, um, we use EndNote in every single review that we do, um, especially during the full text review. It's a really great tool for uploading all the PDFs and you can review them and include, exclude, and tag all inside of EndNote because most of the products don't do that full text inclusion for you. Um, so EndNote is a great place for that. It also helps you cite while you write and it manages all that. We have instructions on how to set up EndNote. Um, on this guide. We also have a video that we did uh, um, last semester, I believe, on tools for systematic reviews where we talk about EndNote, and that's also located on our LibGuide um, and on our, our workshop series page on our past recordings page as well. So um, we go through all of these things on EndNote um, on those two different resources. And um, so I'm sorry about the typo on this slide. Um, can you give an example of a systematic review and a scoping review question? So a systematic review question would be something like, what is the effectiveness of Gardasil vaccine compared with Sera vaccine in preventing human papilloma, infect human papilloma virus infection in adolescents and young women? Again, it really fits that PICO framework. Um, you're comparing two different vaccines, um, and it's a, a, a definitely a clinical question. So a scoping review question would be um, what types of neurological reactions to the human papillomavirus vaccination have been reported? So two very different questions. One's very clinical, and that's what fits a, a systematic review. The other one is um, more broad, and that is really what fits a scoping review. Yeah, and I would add like systematic reviews, like you can actually clearly see that your goal was to probably synthesize your population data there, right, to get better stats on it. While the scoping review is much more vague, right, you're going to probably map um, thematically um, the literature. So you can kind of see the way you're analyzing it is the difference there. Okay, so how do you read a MeSH scope note? So um, we're going to throw this out here. This is a really powerful tool. MeSH is the probably the largest controlled vocabulary. Um, it's freely available to anyone. Um, and it is really powerful because it defines what the controlled vocabulary is. So sometimes the way the database defines a term isn't how you and your specialty will define the term. So that's really important to go to MeSH and look at the definition, look at the tree structure. So everything in MeSH is on this hierarchy. So you can see there on the right that the further up you go in the tree structure, the more um, broad you are, the further down you go, the more narrow you are. Um, and that can really help you broaden and narrow your search. Uh, MeSH is one of the most powerful ways to broaden and narrow your search, even more so than Boolean operators, in my opinion, because you can really hone in on what your topic is. One unique thing that's only in PubMed is everything explodes. So in this case, if I was to search, ex I was to search exercise, then it's going to search everything underneath that. So it's going to ser search all of those examples, running and walking and all of that. Um, so just be aware that's a very unique thing to PubMed. And this is all things you have to consider when building a search for a systematic review or other evidence synthesis. All right. Um, now we have questions, but before I go to your all's questions, really quickly, 
um, I'm going to stop sharing and then go um, pop back over here. Sorry, I just wanted to highlight the, the guide for you all. Um, so if you're on the Medical Center Library's website, if you go to Health Sciences Research Guides, um, you can get to the systematic review guide. This isn't only for MCL. We do have, if you select this request a systematic review consult, you will we'll get other disciplines, STEM, um, the social sciences. Um, we do have um, options for those as well. Um, here's everything that we have kind of talked about today. Um, in the searching the literature, I wanted to show you all, there are tutorials for searching the literature. And then there's this how to document your search. We have several um, extensions, links to Prisma extensions, links to templates for um, how to you know, document and keep track of everything that you're doing in your search, um, data management for systematic reviews, this database coverage table, which you have to um, include all of that information in a systematic review. So again, if you're just getting started and you're not really sure what all you need to um, include, I would suggest getting a librarian involved early um, and early and often. <laughs> um, studies do show that if you have a librarian involved in your systematic review, the quality and reproducibility does go up, it increases. So we always recommend um, if you're working on a project to um, have us consult early on. All right, and so now we're going to open this up to you all. What questions do you have? Stop sharing. You can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, my name's Alicia. Sorry, I don't have the video going. I'm walking my son as I'm listening to this Zoom <laughs> call. Um, but I guess my question is just to clarify, and I know you've said this, but I just want to be very clear, that a scoping review is a form of systematic review. It's just a difference in the methodology. Correct. Yes, it's all the same. It's just how you analyze it is different. The The search and everything is all the same. So it's really the methodology. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You have a question? I'm sorry, I also have a question about the search terms. So in terms of reporting out, um, when it comes to how we're doing our searches, you get you had mentioned that you know certain databases have different ways to search and some you can use subject you'll need to use subject terms. I'm not sure if that's the right phrase, but maybe subject headers. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're re reporting that out for each database, do you need to do a separate reporting of how you looked at the data or how you pulled the articles? Yeah, so I, I can jump in. And, um, so, yes, yeah, so actually with the new Prisma um, for frameworks, you actually have to report all of your search strategies. So there's actually a brand new searching extension or fairly new now. Um, so you actually have to report your search strategy somewhere, whether it's in a supplement or if it's in a repository, there's actually a move to put searches into a repository. Um, there's one called Search Archive that we've been putting our searches into. So yes, everything has to be reported. Um, it also helps for reproducibility later. So if you want to update the search um, in five years, you can do that really easily that way. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I was just, uh, I was thinking about writing that phase and I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to have to write this up this way so I can reproduce it. I want to be sure that I had that. Yeah. And we have information about search archive on our guide as well. But if you have any questions about that and you want to put searches in there, we can help you with it um, as well. Yeah, I would recommend using the, um, on the literature searching page, the documentation template. So that's where you'll record your search um, for every database that you searched. So then you have a recording of it and you can include that in like an appendix. And then if you're doing, if you're including a Prisma flow chart, that's where you would report the numbers that you, uh, the numbers of articles that you retrieved from each database and then your inclusion to exclusion criteria, kind of how you um, kind of went from, you know, maybe 10,000 down to 15. 
So all of that has to be reported. And it's usually a combination of um, the flow chart, the appendices, and then your written methods. Okay, thank you. That's been very helpful. So it just sounds like to me, overall, it's important to document everything that you do. Yes. yes. Templates that have been provided that will help us. Yes. And we actually have a code book that um, I developed last semester, um, and it's available on our guide as well. It's um, so you can like download it's a text file and you can actually put that into like your your folder space and you can document everything there. It actually has examples and leaves space for you to write down everything that you might need for documentation. <laughs> um, and I, I can go pull that and put that into the chat as well. Oh, that would be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? I just popped the code book in there. And it's on that same page that Stephanie just showed you under the searching for literature under documentation. Will we get access to this um, PowerPoint? Yes, yeah, so you'll get the follow-up um, email um, with the link to the PowerPoint, um, as well as the, the video tutorial should be updated onto our guide as well. So you can come back and rewatch this. Um, and then the links will also be put into the email follow-up. I think you get that either tomorrow or the day after. You, so you'll get it this week. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? We also have, um, I don't have the link really handy, but you will get a follow-up link um, for a survey for this research workshop. Um, so we encourage you to fill that out. And if you have further questions for us, um, we, we'll stay on here just a little bit so that if you have questions, right. you are feel free to ask them. And then um, you can get a hold of us by emailing micklib at uky.edu. Um, that will help you answer questions or help you ask the questions to us. If you all have any, feel free to ask. I'm pulling the um, link here too. So if you all do want to fill out the survey for us, Beth, that would be great. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> oh, thank you, Beth. I, was just, I just got it. <laughs> she beat me to it. Yeah. So Michelle at UKY.edu will get a hold of anyone in the medical center library with questions. And then if you're from a different discipline, um, we will forward those on yeah. to your um, appropriate um, librarians. We thank you all for coming and hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah.